Welcome to our webinar titled, Treating MDS, What to Expect from Treatment. Thank you for joining us. My name is Cottrell Harris, and I'm the manager of learning events for the Aplastic Anemia MDS International Foundation, and I will be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I would like to take the time to acknowledge Alexion Pharmaceuticals, Amgen, and the Celgene Corporation for providing educational grants to help support this and other webinar education programs. I would also like to share with you some additional educational opportunities you might be interested in. This year, the AA and MDS International Foundation is hosting several regional conferences on living with aplastic anemia, MDS, or PNH. These free regional conferences will occur around the country and are designed to make information on bone marrow failure diseases more accessible to patients and families. We have already had two successful conferences in Phoenix and Houston, and registration for the remaining four are open. The next conference is in Cleveland, Ohio on June the 22nd, followed by San Francisco, California on July the 20th. We'll be in Boston, Massachusetts on September the 7th. And finally, our last conference will be held in Tampa, Florida on November the 9th. Please visit our website, www aamds.org for more information on the conferences and all of our learning events. Today's webinar will be archived on our online learning center within 7 to 10 business days. You will be notified when it is live and ready for viewing. Immediately following the presentation, there will be a question and answer session. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation by using the text chat window on the lower right-hand side of your screen to submit a question or comment. Type your question in the small text box just below the text chat window. When you have finished typing your question, hit enter. We will do our best to get to all questions. When asking questions, I do ask that you do two things to help us manage incoming questions. First, please submit your entire question all at the same time. Do not submit it in pieces or send additional information. We do receive many questions and will not be able to piece your question together for multiple submissions. Lastly, provide the minimum amount of personal information you feel is necessary to respond to your question. Lengthy questions can be difficult to understand and to respond to. You will not be able to communicate with others during the session via the chat window. We will be the only one who can see your questions as they are being asked. If you would like to connect with others, there is an online support form called Merrill Forms available at www.merrillforums one word, dot org, that you can access via our website. We also have a peer support network and a national network of volunteers, including patients, caregivers, and family members willing to listen and offer support. Immediately following this webinar, a post-event survey will pop up on your screens. Please take a few moments to complete the brief survey. This will help us to improve our future webinars and make sure we are meeting your needs. Again, as a reminder, you can submit your questions on the right-hand side of your screen at any time. Today's presenter is Dr. James Rossetti. Dr. Rossetti is the Associate Director of the Cell Transplantation Program, Associate Director of Fellowship Training, and Director of Clinical Apheresis at the Western Pennsylvania Hospital. Dr. Rossetti earned his Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine degree from the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine and completed an internship in internal medicine residency at St. Francis Medical Center of Pittsburgh. He did fellowship training in hematology and medical oncology at the Western Pennsylvania Hospital and is board certified in medical oncology and hematology. He is an assistant professor at the Temple University School of Medicine and an adjunct clinical instructor for the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine. Dr. Rossetti is, recognized, is a recognized expert in hematological malignancy with particular interest in myeloid malignancy, acute myelogenous leukemia, myelodysplasia, and cellular therapy. He is an accomplished clinical investigator with numerous publications in the scientific and lay literature and is particularly sought after as a speaker. Dr. Rossetti serves on the advisory board and the medical advisory committee of the Leukemia and Lymphoma, Lymphoma Society of Western Pennsylvania. He is also an active participant in the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society's team and training events. He serves as a member and consultant on the Western Pennsylvania Hospital's Ethics Committee and also functions as the chairman of the hospital's Cancer Committee. At this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Rossetti. Welcome, Dr. Rossetti. 
Thank you, Cottrell. Thanks very much, uh, everyone, for uh, joining the, the webinar. I hope that you find it useful. <clears throat> As you can see, the, uh, the, the title here that I've chosen is uh, myelodysplasia with a focus on higher risk disease. And though we're going to primarily talk about high risk disease because there's so much happening in that particular area, and as many of you uh, well know, uh, it's the high risk patients where uh, the treatment paradigm takes a little bit of a different turn in that not only do we want to help cytopenia and of course continue to improve upon quality of life, but we also seek to prevent the, the potential risk of development into acute myeloid leukemia. Um, but th as I said, though, though we're focusing primarily on higher risk disease, I do want to talk a bit about low risk disease as well, um, in large part because uh, we're also seeing a lot of wonderful developments. And I think the excitement about myelodysplasia in general um, is that there's a lot happening in the field over a very short period of time. This is a relatively new disease, as it were. I tell my fellows all the time, you're, you're really entering the field at a good time, a time where you can make a dramatic difference with maybe one study in a, in, in a few short months or maybe a couple of years, um, we, we can make tremendous benefits. As many of you well know, there was very little we could do for myelodysplastic syndromes just uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, the natural history of the disease was the natural history of the disease. If you develop myelodysplasia, and required, uh, had low blood counts, we would give transfusion support, maybe give antibiotics, help to pre prevent infection, et cetera. Um, but our goals are, were very, very different then than they are today, because today we can do things to change the natural history. Um, back then, the disease would progress as it would progress to acute leukemia or higher risk uh, MDS or evolve into other types of uh, bone marrow disorders. And today we're really trying to, to, to do things that can change that and prevent some of these more um, serious complications from developing and uh, hopefully prolong survival and even, dare I say, cure patients with this disease. And as, as you've all heard, I'm sure the only known curative um, approach to myelodysplastic syndromes is um, one of uh, allogeneic or unrelated donor transplantation or maybe even cord blood transplantation. And the good news is that the, the risk associated with transplant has also improved dramatically. Um, so 15 years ago, 20 years ago, the chances of dying from such a transplant was quite high, even in the first um, 100 days, maybe estimated to be about 40%. And today that number's come down quite a bit to 10 or 15%. Moreover, we're, we're increasing the eligibility for transplantation as we fine-tune what we call the conditioning regimen, the treatment that's given just prior to transplant. And as a result, we're able to routinely transplant patients beyond the typical 50 or 55 years of age and transplant up maybe to 65 or even 70 or slightly older on, uh, on clinical trials. And we've learned really what predicts outcomes in transplant. It's not just age, as I'm sure some of you have heard from your physicians um, as well. There are many things that are more important than age in predicting outcomes. We do what's called the comorbidity index. So I think the, the progress we've made in, in transplantation is tied hand in hand very, very intimately with myelodysplastic syndromes because these are diseases, as we well know, generally speaking, of older individuals. The concerns for somebody like myself and other physicians who treat this disease is that we're seeing these entities in younger and younger people. And we have to, of course, ask ourselves why. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as we, uh, as we go uh, throughout the course of the program uh, today. And then, as Cottrell said, I'm glad to um, stay on the line for as long as necessary to answer uh, questions. Uh, that anyone might have. I see that some people are already starting to send their questions in, and I, I do appreciate that, and hopefully I can, uh, can help answer some of these questions. So, again, I thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to present today. I'm here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We are experiencing the storms, as I'm sure many of you have. Um, it was quite an interesting uh, night, and we'll see what tonight brings, uh, but thank God uh, nothing, nothing too serious. Though if you saw on the news the black bear sighting in the neighborhood, that was actually right down the street from me. So uh, that was uh, an interesting development here in Pittsburgh as well. We've been in the news a little bit. Um, so let's, progress, let's talk about, uh, about the myelodysplastic syndromes. This is another one of these what, when I was your age type of uh, type of slides. I tell my fellows, really, uh, uh, this is a disease that really is coming of age. And you can see that just back in 1987, cancer treatment, Haskell's text, which is a pretty well-known and respected text um, in our field, you can see that just less than one page was dedicated to the myelodysplastic syndromes. And again, these are a group of syndromes. I would bet, I, I, I'm not entirely sure how many people are on the line, but I've heard it might be as many as 100 or so. And if that's the case, each one of you may have a very, very different story. 
And so, you know, people will often tell us, why can't you find a cure for cancer? Why can't you treat this? Well, we know that these diseases are very, very different. There's what we call heterogeneity between, uh, it, between individuals with these diseases. And though the marrow might look very, very similar to the naked eye, we know that each person is very different. Each person has different uh, uh, medical illnesses. Each person's a different age. Each person's goal might be very, very different. And as, as I go through, especially at the end of the program, I want to talk a little bit about quality of life because I think it's really important that you speak to your physicians about what is important important to you. I, I, again, tell my fellows all the time, quality of life is really dependent on the individual. Uh, my quality and your quality may be two very different things. I've had patients tell me, Doc, I just want to be able to dance at my son's wedding. And then I've had others who tell me, I want a mountain bike. And so, uh, and, and of course, if you have low platelets in your mountain biking, that's a major issue. And our goal to get your platelets up might be a little bit different than it may be for someone else. So um, not all treatment is the same. Uh, for sure. So talk, we'll, we'll talk about quality of life quite a bit um, as we move on. Um, but again, we're, we're, things are really changing rapidly. As you can see, just uh, so nine years later in the yearbook of hematology, we went up to two pages. We went from less than a page to two pages. And then just within a year later, we went up to six. Now, the downside to that, we got a little bit excited. We said, well, now we're covering six pages in uh, on this particular entity but that's one of the biggest books that you'll ever see in our field that that particular textbook has over 3,000 pages in it so six out of 3,000 isn't quite a lot when you consider that some of the other entities had over a hundred pages associated with them moving on to clinical oncology a big a famous textbook of ours as well called Abelhoff 17 pages just three years thereafter and then Williams hematology up to 17 pages with 376 references and you can see that in just a very short period of time we made a huge jump that uh, late of uh, uh, 19 uh, that late 1990 time into the uh, early 2000s was a real area of progress for us and it was just a few short years later in 2004 when the first drug became a Available that altered the natural history of the disease in azacitidine, which we're going to talk about quite a bit as well. And then in 2002, just a couple years, just one year thereafter, we now have a, it's the first textbook dedicated solely to the myelodysplastic syndromes. So you can see this is not an old disease. And although the disease was described a long time ago, it really hasn't been paid its due, its, it, it's, right, its own right, until very, very recently, just over the past couple of decades. So we're learning a lot in a very short period of time, and that's really impacted how we treat the disease. Um, probably the most important thing that we've learned is what drives this process. Biologically, what's going on in the bone marrow of individuals who have myelodysplasia? Um, and as a result, we've, we've identified various pathways that we can now target. And so targeted therapy, another reason why individualized therapy may be a reality in the future, much like it's becoming in some lymphomas, um, where we can identify certain biological markers in individual patients that are more profound than others. Um, that's the hope for the future, that not everybody's treatment would be the same, uh, not every low-risk patient would be the same, and every high-risk and intermediate, et cetera, but that we could really identify which treatments are best for Bob or Joe or Linda or Janet, um, and that's where we're headed, and I think that's the excitement. So this disease was first described in the 1900s, actually, the early 1900s, and not a lot was known about the disease, and there was, in fact, some debate about these patients who had sort of what they were referring to as, as refractory anemia. Their counts weren't really improving, and that term later became effectively uh, a, a well-known association with the myelodysplastic syndromes. Most patients who had MDS were in that category of what was referred to as refractory anemia, patients who essentially had an anemia that responded to nothing. And that was, um, that's really all we had. Well, we've learned since then that, again, everybody's different, and we have various categories that patients fall into. But what I find very interesting is, though, the disease was described in the medical literature as a, as a potential entity in 1900, um, it wasn't until 1982 that we really defined these group, this group of disorders as clonal malignant diseases. And that scares a lot of people. Um, because in our mind, as, as cancer physicians, what defines a cancer is an abnormal clone of cells, essentially. Now, that doesn't mean that it can spread to different parts of the body, like we think of breast cancer can go from the breast into the lung or the bone or other areas of the body. 
MDS is sort of, it's, it's primarily a bone marrow driven disorder and there's a defect in a group of, of what we call hematopoietic stem cells. Um, and what these stem cells are meant to do is develop into the mature blood cells. Well, a population of these um, become clonal. They become a copy of themselves and they become defective. And that population of cells eventually overpopulates the bone marrow and instead of becoming healthy platelets or healthy um, uh, uh, red cells or white cells to fight infection, um, they don't. They don't mature properly. Or if they do mature, they mature into dysfunctional cells, cells that may be there in number but not there in quality. We're going to talk about that more as well. If we look at the incidence of, of myelodysplastic syndromes in the United States, what's really striking is that just 10 years ago, it was estimated that – and the incidence, by the way, is the number of new cases annually – and so you can see here on this slide, we say about 25,000 new cases per year today. And many experts believe that this is underestimated, and it's more like 35,000, and in the next decade it may be as high as, as 50,000. But just 10 years ago, that number was estimated to be between five and 7,000. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, why we're seeing more and more myelodysplasia in a country that is as advanced as the United States. Part of it, of course, is we live longer than, many, than people in other nations. The life expectancy here is quite high, and as a result, we tend to see diseases that affect older individuals much more frequently. That said, there's more to it than just that. We also know that we can diagnose this condition pretty easily these days or easier than we used to be able to. In the old days, you did a bone marrow biopsy, you looked at the cells, and if they were atypical in appearance, you, there were criteria that said, okay, this is dysplasia, this is myelodysplastic syndrome, meaning atypical cells arising from the bone marrow uh, early precursors. Well, what we do know about MDS is it doesn't always look that obvious. We can have uh, 10 different hematopathologists who are pathologists dedicated to looking at bone marrow specimens look at a slide, and many, many of them will say this is MDS, and others will say, no, it's not MDS. And so it, it's, it's not always a clear-cut case. And in some patients, it's very, very obvious, and in other patients, not so obvious. Well, we now have other tools that we can look at. I'm sure many of you are familiar with cytogenetic testing. This is where we do, uh, uh, we, we actually analyze the DNA entirely and we try to determine if there are certain defects in certain chromosomes, chromosomes that are linked to bone marrow disorders. Certain chromosomal abnormalities are high risk, some are low risk, and some are in between, what we call the good, the bad, and the ugly. And those are very predictive in terms of how patients are going to do. But they're also prognostic to a degree, and we'll talk about that more, uh, I'm sorry, diagnostic to a degree, and we're going to talk about that more as well. Because when you don't have the obvious atypical appearance of the bone marrow, one of the things you need to look at is the cytogenetics to help make the diagnosis and make the prognosis as well. But there's something else that I would suggest is important, and that is we live in an industrialized world. And as a result, we are exposed to things that we probably shouldn't be. Many people are in industries whereby there's benzene exposures and other solvents and, and, and chemicals that increase the risk. There was a big body of literature back in the day that suggested hair dyes and other things, and that is not necessarily the case with the newer hair dyes. We don't know. Um, but we know that we're exposed to chemicals. Not only are we exposed to chemicals that might lead to the development of myelodysplasia, plastic syndromes, but we're exposed to medications and radiation therapies that might lead to the development of myelodysplastic syndrome. Some of you may have heard or even have what we call a secondary or treatment-related type of disorder uh, of a myelodysplastic syndrome, whereby you had treatment for maybe breast cancer or maybe even uh, a, a lung disorder of some kind where you were on cytoxin or um, some other agent. Maybe a bone marrow transplant for a lymphoma, which cured the lymphoma but led to the, the potential development of, of a myelodysplastic syndrome down the road. And what's interesting is that a lot of the drugs that we use in cancer medicine, per se, are now being used in rheumatology, in neurology, and a host of other areas. So it's really important if you think you have one of these diseases or if you've been diagnosed that you talk to your hematologist about what medications you've been on in the past because we know that sometimes the patients who have the treatment-related type tend to be a bit more aggressive, and there's certain patterns we look for, and we might treat you a bit, more, uh, a bit differently. Um, I think that's important to know. Um, as well. So these are some of the reasons why the incidence is going up. We're curing cancer better than ever, but sometimes at the expense of the development of another process. If one looks at the prevalence, and that's the number of people alive at any given point in time in the United States with this condition, it's about 55,000. Now, 
one of the things that's interesting is that you know you, you, the, the the incidence and the prevalence are sort of starting to divide a little bit. They used to really approximate one another. People were living and die, but people were getting diagnosed and dying relatively quickly, and we're starting to see a little bit of a disparity there, and that there's a gap, a widening area, which is nice to see. That suggests that people are living longer with this disorder, uh, with this group of disorders. And again, it's a it's it is a group of disorders, not any one entity. Um, but that's a good sign, and I think that has a, a lot to do with the fact that supportive care is better nowadays. Transfusion medicine is safer than ever. It's actually very interesting. If one looks at in a disease like acute myeloid leukemia, which is one of the risks of having myelodysplasia, one can develop acute myeloid leukemia. One of the fascinating things about that is that one of the, the, the biggest advances we made in the overall survival of acute leukemia was the ability to, to transfuse platelets in the 1960s. Prior to that, you couldn't do anything for, an, for a low platelet count, and patients would have bleeding complications. So we're certainly doing better with transfusion support, antibiotic support, et cetera. Um, supportive care is much better than ever, but we're also starting to scratch the surface of the natural history of the disease with medications, not just transplantation. More on that in a bit. More good news for MDS today. Most of the cases are diagnosed with lower risk disease. Two thirds of the patients we diagnose today have low risk disease, which again is important. It's important for primary care physicians to not ignore low blood counts. Low blood counts are not a normal variant of age. Now, sometimes they mean absolutely nothing, and it may just be an established baseline for a patient that is normal for them. But if the blood counts are different, especially as we get older, especially if we've had treatment for another cancer, et cetera, if the counts improve after treatment and then fall, that's a concern. And, and, uh, and it's really important, and I know the MDS Foundation is really keen on this, is educating primary care physicians to get patients referred early so that we can find patients at lower risk disease so we can do appropriate things to prevent the, the long-term complications of acute leukemia um, and more dramatic drops in the blood counts. And we also know the significant number of people with low-risk disease will have profound symptoms, and there's things that we can do to help those as well. This is a disease of one-thirds. I always also remind my, my fellows and I educate people, despite the fact that two-thirds of the patients are diagnosed with a low-risk disease, about one-third will potentially die of a complication of the disease. About one-third will go on to develop acute leukemia, and finding that group of people is really important to us so we can, you know, hopefully make that zero, but at the very least take it from 30-some percent down into the single digits if possible. Um, and then a third are going to die of something totally unrelated. Again, this tends to be a disease of older individuals. So um, how we treat um, is is, is really does depend on where you are uh, at the time of diagnosis in terms of your risk stratification, and we're going to talk a lot about that. This is the classical clinical paradox of myelodysplastic syndromes. And again, it, under, it, 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 draws, uh, it br brings a highlight to the fact that we're understanding the biology of the disease much better than we used to. Um, what you end up with is essentially low blood counts, right? That's how the vast majority of people have been diagnosed. They presented with anemia or thrombocytopenia, which is a low platelet count, or maybe leukopenia or neutropenia, low white blood cell count. So we call that cytopenia, and that can be variable. Some patients have all three cell lines involved. Some will have one. Some will have two. Interestingly, when we check the bone marrow, the bone marrow is hypercellular. And the cellularity of our bone marrow as we get older is 100 minus our age. At any given time, our bone marrow should be 100 minus our age, the cellularity of the bone marrow, plus or minus 10%. That means for a 50-year-old, half the marrow should be fat and half the marrow should be cells. With each decade of our life, about 10% of our bone marrow, much like the rest of our bodies, gets replaced by fat. And that's normal. An 80-year-old, for instance, should have a bone marrow that's about 20% cells and 80% fat. But an 80-year-old that has a 50% cellular marrow might suggest that that's a myelodysplastic syndrome. That's a hypercellular bone marrow. Now, why is the bone marrow hypercellular? Why do we see a ton of cells in the bone marrow but too few in the peripheral blood? Well, some of the things we've understood we've already talked about. There's a clonal evolution or an expansion of an abnormal population of cells that is doing one of two things, either not producing the mature cells that are getting into the circulation or producing them, but they're dying too early, a process we call apoptosis, that these cells, you might see tons of, say, neutrophils in the, blood, in the bone marrow, but not in the bloodstream. These are mature white blood cells. Why would we see that? Well, we know that there's a process and many enzymes that can kill the cells before they enter into the bloodstream. And shutting down those pathways that are killing these cells prematurely is one mechanism by which we can potentially treat the disease. And so I share this slide 
essentially to say we're learning how the disease operates so we can start to treat it more effectively. And that's why we have a host of different uh, agents available to us because there's so many different pathways of, uh, that, that, are, that's, that lead to the development of the disease. And again, we're going to talk about that um, more as we uh, go through uh, through the program. Now, there are a subset, and I want to touch on this, because some people on the line may have what's referred to as hypocellular MDS. This is where the bone marrow cellularity is too low. It's akin to a disease that the Myelodysplastic Syndrome Foundation is, is uh, also has in their name, the aplastic anemia and Myelodysplastic Syndrome Foundation. The reason is aplastic anemia has a low cell count in the bone marrow and low cell count in the blood, as does hypocellular MDS. And they're almost, they're, they're kissing cousins. They're very, very similar disorders. And pathologists sometimes have a hard time distinguishing between the two. The reality is both respond very differently um, to, to treatment. They respond to immune suppressive therapy. It's thought that, there's, that there is a, an immune attack, almost like a rheumatological disorder on the bone marrow. And in these patients, oftentimes they'll have what's called a PNH clone. Perhaps you've seen that um, name thrown around, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. And we test for that in MDS as well because some patients who have that little bit of a clone might also respond to immune suppressive therapy. So I want to mention that. And if anybody has that particular um, entity, you can feel free to shoot a question. I'm glad to address it further. But again, the treatment tends to be a little bit, um, a little bit different. So this is the bone marrow, um, a, a few different bone marrow slides, as you can see here, um, of uh, individuals who have um, uh, this particular disorder. And I'm going to start here, and hopefully you can see the little green arrow moving around. This is a very, very atypical, obvious myelodysplastic bone marrow. This cell right here, this large one in the center, is what we call a megakaryocyte. A megakaryocyte has one job, and that's to produce platelets. Well, this one's too small. It should be about five or six times the cells around it, and as you can see, it's only about double the size of some of the cells around it. So it's what we call a micromegakaryocyte. It should have multiple lobes. It only has two. It's hypolobate. This is a hypersegmented neutrophil. This is a mature white blood cell. Well, there's far too many little lobes sticking out of it, and that's a dysplastic cell as well. What doesn't... doesn't um, uh, necessarily project very easily is that this cell should also have lots of granules in it. And these granules have a job in life of, of fighting off infection, and they're low. They're not there in, in, um, in proper numbers. This is a cell that we refer to as a pseudopelgar Huey anomaly. It looks like a kidney, a kidneys inside of the cell there. And then there's lots of immature cells with these, what we call blebbing of the cytoplasm. This should be a nice smooth contour. It's very atypical. These early red blood cell precursors should be nice and smooth and very, very round, and they're not. They're atypical. This is MDS. I share this because most of the time it's not this obvious, and that's why we have to look at other things like cytogenetic testing and maybe PNH testing, um, flow cytometry, and other methods by which we can more accurately make the diagnosis. These cells are so atypical, they're probably monocytes, um, but we really don't know what these are because they're so dysplastic. And then the cell here is what we call a pronormoblast. It's an early red blood cell precursor. It should not have two lobes in it, and you can see it also has within it something we call a nucleoli, and that's abnormal as well. And then down here we have what's called a ring sideroblast. And so another thing I think is important is to recognize the fact that some patients with myelodysplastic syndromes will have iron overload, not only after they've received multiple transfusions, but even at the time of diagnosis, because they have sometimes what's called a functional iron deficiency, whereby all of the iron that we're consuming, and unless we're a young menstruating female, there's no way really to get rid of the, the iron that we eat. It should be utilized. If that iron's not being utilized, it will just accumulate in the mitochondria around the cell. And you can see here these, these blue dots, those are all iron, uh, th those are I that's basically iron overload in the, the area of the cell. And this is what we call a ring sideroblast that can be present more or less in some patients with MDS. And that begs the question, what do we do about iron overload? And as we know today, we do have good things to do for patients with iron overload. If we're lucky enough to get somebody to transplant and get their hemoglobin normal, we can phlebotomize the patient, take blood off to get rid of that iron. There's good iron chelators out there like oral X-Jade nowadays, which is very useful as well. Um, and then some of the older sub-Q and IV infusions can be done as well. They're a bit more cumbersome, but they can be very, very effective. And so uh, managing iron overload becomes an issue in MDS, and we can always talk about that more um, as well. But I think it's important to track ferritin levels because we're learning more and more, especially for patients who are going to transplant, that, that uh, we might want to get that iron level down um, to prevent long-term uh, complications. Um, so 
I'm going to turn off the arrow. Again, importantly, this slide here uh, is, uh, demonstrates our biological understanding of the disease. We know there's certain cytogenetic abnormalities, as you can see right here. And what cytogenetic abnormality you have can occasionally predict which type of treatment you're going to respond to. We know patients with, specifically with the 5Q- minus abnormality respond beautifully to lenalidomide, also known as Revlimid. Um, that drug is very, very effective for patients with low-risk disease who are transfusion-dependent and have that particular abnormality. We also know that some patients without that particular abnormality might benefit from lenalidomide as well, um, but not quite as often. Nevertheless, it's a very good drug, and it's now being used in conjunction with other drugs in clinical trials, um, and that's sort of where we're going. As you'll see, we're moving into the potential for combined modality therapy because, again, as you can see just from this slide alone, there's multiple pathways that cause this disease to occur, and if we target more than one at a time, we might do the patient a better service. Secondly, there's something called epigenetic. Oh, I want to go back very quickly, I'm sorry, to, to, to genetic abnormalities because some of, the, some of the ones that tend to be higher risk, like deleted chromosomes, Chromosome 7, it seems as though those patients respond best to epigenetic modifiers, specifically methyltransferase inhibitors, uh, uh, also known as azacytidine and descytidine. And what epigenetics says is essentially this. The DNA may be completely normal, but it may be packaged abnormally. And as a result of this abnormal packaging, the cells don't mature normally because certain genes that are required for their de normal maturation and development are silenced because of this abnormal packaging. Sometimes there's what we call methyl groups stuck on the cytosine residues of DNA, and sometimes the DNA is wound too tightly. And we now have two classes of agents available to us which target both of those processes. One, it, one are the methyltransferase inhibitors I mentioned, and the other are a continuing investigation in this group of disorders. They're called histone deacetylase inhibitors. Um, there are a couple drugs out there now that are approved actually for other disorders, um, lymphomas primarily, but are being investigated in myelodysplastic syndromes, and um, uh, there's some others that are, are, are also being investigated that aren't yet approved. I talked about the accelerated apoptosis or programmed cell death. The cells die too early in their development, proliferation of an abnormal clone, something called stromal dysregulation. Now, this is interesting because part of the problem, the stroma is like the soil of the bone marrow. In the bone marrow, there's really interaction between two spaces. One is the soil. One is where the cells sort of root themselves, and the other is the free-floating population of cells. The stroma, the soil, has to communicate and tell these cells when to, when to detach, when to adhere, when to mobilize into the bloodstream. And there can be a dysregulation or a miscommunication between the two. And as a result of this miscommunication, certain enzymes are overproduced, which lead to significant symptoms like sometimes fevers, excessive fatigue. Even if your blood counts aren't that bad, we know that some patients with MDS will have decent blood counts but still feel rotten. And we can do things to help blunt that as well. And then lastly, medullary angiogenesis which is basically new cell growth or new uh, blood vessel growth within the bone marrow um, that can also cause problems in myelodysplasia and shutting that off with agents like lenalidomide or thalidomide um, might be uh, useful as well. So I share this slide with you, not to confuse you, it's a, it's a lot of science, but it's really, and I'm, I'm not a scientist, I'm a clinician, um, but it's our understanding of the disease that's allowed us to more effectively treat it uh, for sure. So this is the therapeutic challenge that we face. On the one side of the balance, you see on the left, ineffective hematopoiesis. What does that mean? Ineffective hematopoiesis means I'm not producing cells in an adequate number or cells that are functioning normally. That's MDS, ineffective hematopoiesis. It's a, it's a, it's a very good working definition of what MDS is. The risk of MDS is twofold. The ineffective hematopoiesis, which is the low blood counts, and the other is the evolution to acute myeloid leukemia, and this is the balance. And what we don't want to happen is to go from this side of the balance to this side and see the scale start to drop. Because once you develop AML from MDS, it's a much harder type of AML to treat. There's something we call de novo AML, which means it just comes out of nowhere. We don't necessarily know why. And then there's AML that evolves from a pre-existing bone marrow disorder like myelodysplasia or myeloproliferative disease, et cetera. That tends to be a more difficult entity to treat. And in those patients, it, we, we tend to induce them with standard chemotherapy and get them very, very quickly to bone marrow transplantation. So the goal has always been, when somebody's diagnosed with MDS, to basically improve quality of life. What can we do to keep patients out of the hospital, feeling good, playing with their kids, 
enjoying vacations with their grandkids, doing the things they love to do. That was the primary goal. And, of course, that hasn't changed. Quality of life is paramount to every treatment we give. And the good news about most MDS treatments is that they're very, very safe, and most of them are well tolerated. Nothing's benign, but um, we can manage the toxicities of most of the drugs. There are a handful of people with virtually every agent who will be intolerant. And in those patients, there's, thank God, other things that we can potentially do. But Apart from quality of life, what else do we want to do? Well, nowadays we're starting to think maybe we can change this natural history. Maybe we can prevent this evolution from occurring. And, God grant it, even turn things back in this direction. May we be able to potentially, in some patients, reverse the process altogether. Now, so far, we know we don't cure patients with MDS, with our, with our uh, therapies outside of transplantation. Suffice it to say, I've treated patients for years and years, seven years plus in some patients who have had high-risk disease. You don't, we don't always know who those patients are going to be, but those patients otherwise probably would have had a survival without therapy of, of may, maybe measured in months or maybe a, a year or two. And so some of the newer agents are changing how the survival is, um, is predicted, and that's good news for us. So quality of life remains very important, and again, what is quality to you is something you really need to discuss with your, with your um, physician. I think it's, it's very, very important that those discussions are, are ha had very, very early. Because some people say, look, I don't care what I have to do to get better. I will, I will stop doing everything else I'm doing. And then there are other patients who say, okay, this is a very serious disease. I like to do X, Y, or Z, and if I can't do X, Y, or Z, my life's not complete. And so there's a balance. And everybody, but again, everybody is different in that regard. And quite honestly, some drugs require that you come into a facility for an infusion or an injection, and other drugs are, are, are given orally that you can take at home. Um, clinical trials, I still say, are in, very important in myelodysplasia and should be the standard of care for everybody if a clinical trial is available. But clinical trials require a lot of back and forth frequently, and so it's a commitment. And um, Again, I would just advise everyone to um, have those discussions with their physicians very, very um, early. Um, you'll find that the paternalistic approach to medicine of you have MDS, this is what we do, I don't care what you have going on in your life, thank God it's gone by the wayside. It's just not appropriate when we're dealing with a disease that has a low cure rate, but success rate and our hope is that we can start to treat it. If we don't cure it, maybe we can treat it like a chronic disease and keep people alive for a very, very long period of time. Quality of life, very important. Now, if this ensues, the transformation from myelodysplasia into acute myeloid leukemia, survival has typically been what we look for because the survival in this group of patients tends to be relatively short. However, again, we're starting to see improvements there primarily because we're able to get more and more patients to bone marrow transplantation. Older and older patients are coming to transplant, patients who have uh, comorbidities or Ill other illnesses that pre precluded transplant in the past might, not, but might now be transplant candidates. One of the other major developments in transplantation, by the way, is the fact that having a sibling donor versus an unrelated donor, the overall survival is now essentially the same because of better typing through the national, that we do through the National Marrow Donor Program. We identify good donors through the National Marrow Donor Program very frequently these days. And so if you don't have a sibling that matches you or the doctor tells you that your sibling's too old to be a donor for you, even though they do match, it's good news that we can find a donor through the National Marrow Donor Program and the survival's not necessarily any different. And that's a, that's a new development because 10, 15 years ago, there was a 10, 15% disparity in terms of overall outcomes using an unrelated donor versus a, versus a sibling. Siblings did better on average. That's not the case today. Again, because our treatments for things like graft-versus-host disease, et cetera, are much better than they, uh, than they used to be. I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of the myelodysplastic syndrome classifications and what you see here. The old French-American-British um, FAB classification looked at the number of blasts in the bone marrow and how that relates to overall survival. The WHO classification really helped us to better understand the disease and started to look more closely at certain cytogenetic abnormalities as being good or bad, and in the case of the 5Q minus abnormality, it tends to be a good one. Um, the nomenclature changed. The naming of the disease changed. Somebody with refractory anemia, when they, when they just had uh, maybe low platelets, that doesn't really fit. So now we have refractory cytopenia. Um, we know that the blast count is still important, but we started to look at uh, at other things like cytogenetics. More importantly today, most physicians use what's called the International Prognostic Scoring System, which is our best prognostic tool. And this tool is devised using three variables, the number of blasts in your bone marrow, 
the DNA abnormality that you have or don't have, and the number of, of cell lines that's involved in the blood. Do you have one cell line low or two or three or even zero? And then we come up with a total score. Some of you may have seen now there's a revised international prognostic scoring system. There's one, there's one that it combines the WHO. But basically what we're trying to determine is who is truly low risk and who is truly high risk. If one were to look at the FAB classification, the average survival based solely on BLAST is between six months and three years in an untreated patient. We know that that is grossly underestimates and scares the vast majority of people, and it's not accurate. And so what we, do, what we now know is that if we look at these variables, the number of cell lines, the DNA abnormality, et cetera, and we come up with a total score for you, the survival can be measured it, 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 much more. With, and this is in an untreated patient, again. Um, it can be many years, almost a decade in some cases, versus only a few months in the higher risk, again, untreated. The good news is we know that our treatments can change these numbers. But this is a better tool for our patients to say, if we don't do something, this is what may or may not happen. And of course, all of these tools are available to you on, um, on the website. Um, oh, excuse me, I apologize there. Um, so if we look at the FAB versus the IPSS, the most important predictor is testing DNA. So if you don't know your DNA abnormality, it may not be important for you to know, but it's certainly important for your physician to know. And one of the best things I've seen over the past decade of lecturing people on myelodysplastic syndromes, especially the community groups, is DNA has to be studied. We have to know the site of genetic abnormality. If we don't, we might downstage our patients but as much as 30% of the time, meaning we might tell you that your risk is, of disease is lower than it actually is. And again, that's very important because what therapy we use is predicted by where you fall in that group of four, um, what we call low, intermediate one, intermediate two, and high. Now, I want to talk a little bit about treatment um, because there's a lot of treatments out there. But I want to talk about specifically first about chemotherapy because chemotherapy is generally true chemotherapy. The type of chemotherapy we use for leukemia is not used very frequently at all today. Um, it's, it's used last line in myelodysplasia because we know that we have much more gentle, safer products available to us that are more effective than chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, you can see here in this slide, in the, in the 1980s and 1990s, um, there, where, where, where chemotherapy was not used, and then later on, excuse me, um, where chemotherapy was not used very frequently, um, and then um, where it started to ramp up in this decade here in between, you can see the survival rates are almost identical. And essentially what that tells us is that chemo doesn't work very well for this for these group of disorders. Now, I don't want to say that there's absolutes, because MDS, of all the diseases we treat, probably has the least number of absolutes. Some patients do respond, but we know that more patients respond to the other treatments if they're appropriately staged at the time of diagnosis. Um, so mention briefly transplantation. Um, transplantation is, again, the only known cure. On average, about half the people are going to be cured, but that number is highly variable. And so 50% might not seem like a, a big number, but in some studies, the number is much higher than that. In some studies, it's lower. And there are many predictors, and I would say I could probably talk to each one of you and come up with a different outcome. Um, a, a potential uh, a benefit from transplantation because each person is very, very unique. Um, but again, the good news today is that we're transplanting more and more patients with myelodysplastic syndromes because we can transplant patients who are older. About 10, 15 years ago, it was estimated that only about 5% of patients with MDS would ever go to transplant. Nowadays, it's probably 15%, and in some centers, it's much higher than that even. I want to talk a little bit about non-ablative transplantation because you may have heard, maybe you've talked to your physician about what a transplant, about transplantation, and you've heard about ablative or what we call a conventional transplant versus a mini transplant or a transplant light, or sometimes referred to as reduced intensity or non-myeloablative. And what that type of transplant says is this: we're not going to just wipe out your 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 MDS. Um, we're going to do we're going to do something a little different. We're going to knock your MDS down uh, enough, but more importantly, we're going to knock your immune system down. And by, by suppressing your immune system, we can then infuse the donor cells and allow the donor cells to do the majority of the work by attacking immunologically the abnormal clone of cells that's in your body. And I put a question mark next to that. And the reason that there's a question mark there is that the clinical trials in MDS with a reduced intensity transplant are um, are, are are essentially um, continuing. And we don't have a clear answer. We do know patients with lower risk disease tend to do better with non-ablative transplant than 
um, the higher risk uh, patients do. But we're starting to do things around the time of transplant, before and after, that might alter it and make this a better option for some patients. The good news about non-ablative transplant is the chance of dying from such a transplant is much lower than the conventional type. And again, everybody's different. And the statistics is something you have to talk about with your physician directly in terms of what type of transplant is best for you if you're leaning uh, toward transplantation. When do we transplant patients? Again, what we know is that high-risk patients benefit, and these are the international the IPSS scores, low, intermediate one, intermediate two, and high, and you can think of this as stage one, two, three, and four. The patients with stage three and four disease tend to do best if we transplant them very early, um, if we get them to transplant quickly. Now, an early transplant is estimated to be about two to three months. Most of the time, we can't get patients transplanted very, very quickly. Um, uh, because we need to find a donor, and we oftentimes want to get the disease controlled. And one of the things we tend to do with these patients here is give them azacitidine or descitabine, drugs that can delay the risk of leukemic transformation. What we, we had hoped to do was reduce the, le the stage of disease pre-transplant. How that predicts long-term outcomes is a bit unknown to us, but at the very least, it's important for us to get control of the disease so that your disease doesn't go into leukemia before you get to transplant, because then it sets back the transplant even more. Then you have to go through chemotherapy, get in remission, then go to transplant for it to be more effective. On the other hand, the low-risk patients, we tend to wait, and we tend to do other treatments. And, but it, what this suggests to each one of you that might have this disease or if a loved one or friend has this disease is that it requires close monitoring. And that means when we see somebody go from a stage 2 into a stage 3, that's when we really want to start to consider transplant. We don't want to miss it. We don't want to see somebody go from low to high if possible. And so close monitoring, it's, it gets very frustrating for, you, for the poor people who have to get labs every week or twice a week sometimes, see their physician monthly or every three months. But it's important because physicians can follow and should be following trends in your blood counts. Sometimes the low blood counts or the change in your blood counts might be because of the therapy, positive or negative. Other times it could be because the disease is changing its face, at which time frequent bone marrow might be important or repeat bone marrow test. In very young people with myelodysplasia, frequent monitoring of the bone marrow for changes in the DNA status or the blast count is important. So we know when we want to uh, get patients to, uh, uh, to uh, transplantation because we know in the long run, um, if we can get patients transplanted before AML, you can see we have a much better chance of, of, uh, of benefiting the patient. Um, on average, again, somewhere around 50% of the patients are going to be cured with transplantation. The higher risk patients is a little lower. The lower risk patients, it's higher. Do we take a risk of transplanting a low-risk patient? By today's standards, we don't. Again, we tend to wait until they're a little bit higher risk, but the development of these new agents to help control these patients and prevent them from getting to leukemia is what's encouraging. So what can we do in the peri-transplant setting? And what I mean by peri-transplant is the time around transplant. Just before um, uh, uh, transplantation, and just after. Can we use treatment? And, and I, I share this because this is exciting to, to uh, MDS researchers, is uh, can there be uh, azacitidine or descitabine pre or even post-transplant to improve upon long-term outcomes and complete remission rates and, and, and cure rates? And that's something that's being investigated now. And if you have an opportunity to be on one of these clinical trials, it's something I think is worth investigating um, and, and strongly considering. Now, what about growth factors? And I can see that many patients have actually um, entered some, some questions about growth factor support. What growth factors are are things like erythropoietin, also known as Procrit, or Aranesp, you may have heard, or GCSF, also known as Neupogen. And some patients use something called GMCSF or Leukine. Well, we know in low-risk patients, erythropoietin and Neupogen tend to work very, very well. Now, some patients may be on just one or the other. A couple of caveats I want to mention about growth factor support. Um, growth factors are very, um, are very effective in low-risk patients as much as 50% of the time, but you can't quit too early. It takes time, sometimes as much as 8 or 12 weeks to see a benefit. We also know that if your erythropoietin level at the time of your diagnosis, that your nat that's your body's natural hormone that tells the bone marrow to produce red blood cells, if it's low at the time of diagnosis and you're not requiring a lot of transfusions, your chances of responding to erythropoietin alone are quite high. They might be as high as 75%. On the other hand, if you need a lot of transfusion support and your EPO level's high, the chances might be lower. That doesn't mean we don't try it, but we might stop it a little bit earlier than waiting for three months. Um, it's also important to follow something called the reticulocyte count. And I think this is important. I, I think it's important for you to be empowered as patients. 
when you see what's called the reticulocyte count, those are baby red blood cells. And the, the, the hope is that that number's high in response to a low hemoglobin. Hemoglobin suggests you're anemic if it's low. If you're anemic, you're, the body's appropriate response should be to produce reticulocytes, which are baby red blood cells. You'd like that number to be high. If it's not going up on growth factors, it suggests your response not potentially adequate. And this is something your physician will follow, but it's something that you can look at too and say, how am I doing on this treatment? Is it, is it starting to work? Of course, the best thing would be to see your hemoglobin go up, and the best response you're going to see is probably about, about a gram per week. That's about the most you're going to see after the response is achieved. But normally it's about a gram per month in an MDS patient um, it rise in that hemoglobin. So growth factors are effective. The other caveat, though, is that if you're solely anemic, sometimes we add a little bit of nupogen to the treatment. And the reason is that apoptosis that I had mentioned to you um, earlier. And what that is, the, uh, the nupogen uh, treatment stimulates not only the white blood cells, but may turn off that accelerated cell death and cause the hemoglobin to go up. And sometimes it even causes the platelets to go up. So this is one error. This is something we call synergy. And what is synergy? Synergy is basically uh, suggests that the combined uh, modality of treatment is more effective than either uh, together. Um, so this is a patient who had a low-risk disease, as you can see, diagnosed in 1994 and was on erythropoietin alone, and then continued to get transfused. And she very wisely said, well, why am I doing this? And down the road, uh, when the data came out on combined growth factors, erythropoietin plus GCSF, she went on both and looked at this. She did very, very well and continued to go on and continues to do well without requiring transfusion. Very, very exciting. And we see this occasionally. It's, uh, it's exciting to us. And again, it speaks to the issue of um, uh, of potentially uh, com using combined therapy rather than single agents. I mentioned arsenic. Um, usually somebody gets very nervous about this and thinks their spouse is trying to kill them because of the name arsenic, but of course arsenic can be very, very safe if it's monitored. The risk, of course, is cardiac problems, but, um, but we monitor. And arsenic can occasionally be um, used in this disease. We also call it trisinox. But the reason I put this slide up here is more than just to say arsenic might be useful. More importantly than that, look at all the pathways that this drug and a variety of others potentially target. And that's the good news, because we're starting to, def de starting to identify agents that have been around for years that target some of these pathways that can treat MDS effectively and target multiple pathways that can target MDS uh, effectively. So arsenic, as you can see here, can have a reasonable response rate. It's a little bit cumbersome to give, um, but in the European and the United States trial, they were reasonable. It was a reasonable thing and had about a 20 or 25 percent response rate. Now, I want to just um, change tune here a little bit to a case study. And what we're looking at here is a patient who was initially diagnosed with low grade disease and had a 5Q minus abnormality at the time of diagnosis. And um, the patient was started on, uh, on lenalidomide uh, very, very appropriately because, again, the lenalidomide works very effective for these patients with the 5Q minus abnormality and became transfusion independent and uh, remained so for about 14 months. Did very, very well, but then all of a sudden the counts changed. And look at the new blood counts with this patient. What we're seeing here is that the patient is now very what we call thrombocytopenic. The platelets are very low. The hemoglobin has dropped profoundly. And even the white count is starting to dip a little bit with a lower number of neutrophils and blasts in the bloodstream are elevated. These are the leukemic cells, the, the, the ones we worry about. In addition, the patient has some neuropathy of the hands and feet. Now, when you see this on a treatment, the types of things you want to think about are, number one, is my treatment causing my counts to be low? And that's why your physician may say we need a bone marrow. Because if you do the bone marrow and there's no cells, you know the treatment has just been too effective. It's killed everything. On the other hand, if you see progression, which is what we thought was perhaps happening in, uh, in this patient here. The patient continued to have immaturity. The blasts were now rising, so we've gone from a low-risk disease into a high-risk disease. And the patient now, in addition to their 5Q minus abnormality, developed a 7Q deletion, which tends to be a higher-risk abnormality. Again, if your, if your physician tells you you need a marrow, it's usually for one of two reasons. Is the treatment, it's usually for one of three reasons. One is the treatment being, is it, is it effective? Are we achieving our deepest response? Are any low blood counts that we're seeing a result of the treatment, or are they a result of the disease progressing? Well, in this patient, it appeared as though the disease was progressing. So how should we treat the patient once they've tried growth factors early, then went on lenalidomide? 
Number one, should we continue transfusion therapy with iron chelation to maintain a normal ferritin level? Not an unreasonable thing to do. Helping to get the ferritin down is important. Um, should we refer the patient to a transplant center for what's called an autologous transplant, a transplant using their own stem cells? And I mention that here because autologous transplant in MDS is not done because it's a stem cell defect, and all we would be doing is reinfusing abnormal stem cells. Should we increase the dose of the lenalidomide? Probably not, although there are some trials that are showing higher doses might be beneficial in higher risk uh, disease, but this patient's done, done pretty well. The standard of care would be to start this patient on 5-azacitidine, and the reason is this is one of the drugs, in addition to decitabine, that we know can affect all three cell lines and help prevent the risk of, of acute leukemia developing. Very, very important. So getting that bone marrow, as much as it was um, a problem to the patient, gave us a lot of information. We know the lenalidomide is no longer effective, and we've now changed therapies. And so you can see not only in this case scenario the, 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 the importance of sequential therapy, but potentially even what I've talked about before, combined therapy. And so one other option we might add here is number five. Should we add azacitidine to lenalidomide? Or um, if they weren't on lenalidomide, should we have started with a clinical trial of the two together? And that's, again, the crux of ongoing clinical trials, which I'll show you in just a minute. But it's very, very important to get that marrow information so we know uh, what to do next. And the other nice thing about azacitidine, that there is a survival advantage, which previously there was nothing we could do to change survival apart from transplantation. So the patient in this case received 5-azacitidine, as I suggested they, they should, went on for about six months and uh, did well. The hemoglobin uh, got better. The platelets sort of stabilized and the blast um, uh, showed some uh, some improvement down to about 3%. That's pretty good. I would say stay on azacitidine at this point and consider maybe addition of other of other agents. And so what could we add? Well, we talked about epigenetics, and I mentioned to you DNA methylation and histone deacetylation. What's interesting is that these two processes recruit one another. So perhaps at this point, a clinical trial looking at combined azacitidine plus the histone deacetylase inhibitor, what we call the HDAC inhibitor, might be a reasonable thing to do. And again, I don't expect people necessarily in the audience um, uh, to understand what all these things mean, but it's important because it reflects the hope that's developing in MDS. In just 10 years, we've understood this pathway. And medicine's been around an awfully long time, and our understanding has really changed the natural history of the disease by the grace of God. So I'm going to close by talking about epigenetics and epigenetic DNA modification, and primarily looking at azacitidine and descitabine as very standard approaches to this uh, particular treatment. We've had a lot of experience with azacitidine in our institution, treated hundreds of patients, and we were very, very blessed to be part of some of the early trials with azacitidine, the, uh, the early uh, cooperative group trials, and then also in the compassionate use. Um, and so you can see very, very high overall response rates with a significant number of patients, and in particular, these, this high-risk group of patients. And so sometimes in some of these groups of patients, the, the, the additive uh, uh, bars here approached 100%. And so these drugs are very, very effective, and these were the first 92 patients we ever treated um, with, the, uh, with the disease. So um, let's look at uh, the initial trial, and this again, why do I show this? I show this primarily for two reasons. Number one, this was the first agent available to us that showed the risk of leukemic transformation was lower when compared to supportive care. The risk of developing leukemia was better, and look at the overall response rate. We approached 60% in the first trial. But what was very, very striking was this was the first trial that demonstrated profound improvement in quality of life. And you can see that here. And what we call a p-value is what tells us if something is, um, is significant or not. And that's a, a p-value of less than 0 0.05 is what we consider important. And these are profoundly low p-values, which means most of the patients who were treated with azacitidine felt better. Very, very important. And we can say the same for a lot of the newer agents available to us. What's also nice about agents like azacitidine is it might help all three cell lines. And this, the cytobine can do that similarly. Even in low-risk patients, if you have low-risk disease but your platelets are very low, your physician may tell you that Azacitidine is a good option, even though you may have read it's primarily used for higher risk diseases. And I show that uh, in this slide. Also, what's important, and I would say that this slide is almost universal, 
for every t- almost every therapy that we use. I've already suggested to you that it takes maybe up to three months to see a response to growth factor support. Lenalidomide can be the same thing, about three months. Azacitidine, decitabine. While people might respond at three months, the depth of that response may get deeper and deeper and deeper if we continue treatment. And so I would suggest to you, unless your physician tells you you're obviously progressing, um, or if your patient, or if you're not tolerating an agent, most MDS physicians would say stay the course as long as this works. And like my case study that I showed you, stay on the lenalidomide as long as we possibly can, um, and then change therapies. Ride these treatments out so we can in- extend survival. And maybe it's maybe we're looking for a donor. Maybe there's another reason we want to extend the therapy, et cetera. But the reason that I um, the reason that I, I mention this here is. Uh, Oftentimes, a patient will tell me they want to stop their therapy. Maybe it be to go to Florida. Um, we have a lot of that here in, um, in Allegheny County, in Pittsburgh area. Patients will go. Well, the good news is we've developed a large network of physicians around the country who are very, very well-versed in these treatments. And so if your physician tells you, I think it's a little risky, well, maybe it's stopping the therapy. Um, maybe we can space the, the timing out between treatments. But if they tell you that's risky too, we can set you up virtually wherever you're going in the country, um, you know, unless it's in the backwoods of Montana or something, which would be very appealing to me, of course. Um, But we don't want to limit your quality of life and tell you you can't go somewhere. And so getting labs done at outside facilities, even when you're away, is something that can be done pretty easily, and uh, as is getting your treatment um, wherever it may be. So I would just um, talk to your physicians about that if you're worried about vacations and things. Uh, But don't necessarily stop your life, and I think is a very, very important message for each one of you. What's also exciting, and the reason I show this slide, is that even though the, the Food and Drug Administration may have said this is how a drug should be dosed, we as the physicians have an obligation to learn if that's the best way. Maybe that's the clinical trial that got the drug available, but what else can we do to, in, in studies to determine, uh, regulated studies to determine if a treatment might be more effective at a different dose? I think that's very, very important um, as well. And you can see that here. Um, the, the, uh, initially, the dosing, which is now accepted by the FDA, with, azo- with desitabine, rather, um, that showed the highest response rate, this was not the approved dose initially. And so we, we have an obligation to look at that, and I tell my fellows all the time, you could make a big difference in a patient's life by learning something new about a drug they're already on by writing a clinical trial. And so clinical trial becomes very, very important. If you've been diagnosed with cro- chronic myelomonocytic leukemia, um, I would say that this group of drugs, the methyltransferase inhibitors, azocytidine and desitabine, are very, very useful as well, and you can see we just published on that. Um, recently. And for whatever reason, oftentimes the responses are very, very rapid, and that's encouraging. And again, to suggest to you that that there is so much hope in this disease is important to me. And I I will just go through this very, very quickly. But what we found is that our biases are often wrong as physicians. Oftentimes, as physicians, we say young patients with really bad disease should get chemotherapy or should get this or that. Well, the truth of the matter is until we have clinical trials to prove those biases, we should not have them. And in fact, this clinical trial demonstrated that azacitidine did better than chemotherapy, did better than low-dose chemotherapy, standard-dose chemotherapy, or even just supportive care in, um, in patients with high-risk disease, and you can see that here. Overall survival was very, very, um, it, it was beneficial in the vast majority, it was, was beneficial overall compare, compare, in favor of azacitidine over other treatment modalities that I've just mentioned, and that was regardless of um, their age. And you can see here, again, our bias has been traditionally Young patients with very high-risk disease, chemo should be better. Well, we were proven wrong in studies like this. And again, I would say talk to your physicians because there's no room for pride in what we, uh, in what we do. Again, the possibility of combining therapies. We've demonstrated here that potentially adding Nupagen um, to the treatments might be very, very effective, even in, with something like azacitidine. And we saw a profound improvement in the, uh, the overall response rate when Nupagen was added to patients receiving azacitidine. Not the standard of care, but again, demonstrates the important of clinic, importance of clinical trials and the hope that is behind combined therapy. So as patients, what does that mean for you? That means you really you have to know the disease a little bit. Um, you have to have a good rapport with your physician, and sometimes it means being willing to try new things when one potential treatment has failed or it was uh, was not well uh, not well tolerated. Um, so, what can you do with your with that patient that I mentioned? Well, 
You could certainly continue azacitidine until there's disease progression. I think that's important. I wouldn't switch to decitabine at that point, though some would argue if the response to aza is lost, there might be about a 10% response rate if one were to switch to decitabine, maybe at a little bit of a higher or stronger dose. One could consider adding lenalidomide, and certainly one could consider allogeneic transplantation. And I threw in here none of the above. None of the above is the only wrong answer here, actually. All of these are valid options. And, uh, and, and the truth of the matter is, you may be considering all of these things. You may be considering your allo transplant while, consider, while continuing azacitidine or adding lenalidomide to deepen the response. And so I don't mean to scare you by saying we don't know what we're doing, but the truth of the matter is, have these discussions with your patients. And that's why it's important sometimes to have more than a 15-minute visit, especially when there's a consideration of a change of therapy. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's important. And that's the sort of message I want you to, uh, to leave there. Um, okay, I'm just going to close with a couple of things. This is the MDS treatment algorithm. This is what we tend to use at our institution. The first question we ask when somebody's diagnosed with, allergy, with, with, with MDS is, are they a transplant candidate? If they're a transplant candidate and they have high-risk disease, we tend to go immediately to allogeneic or unrelated donor transplantation. And as I mentioned, what else can we do in this population of people? Well, maybe we'll put them on azacitidine um, ahead of time a methyltransferase inhibitor or a descitabine to control the disease pre-transplant, or maybe we'll consider a clinical trial where we put them on one of these two agents after the transplant. Well, what if they're a transplant candidate but they have low risk disease? And then I throw in here a hodgepodge, and you can see there's a vast, there's a significant number, there's growth factors, there's thalidomide or lenalidomide, a methyltransferase inhibitors, immune suppressive agents, and there's no right answer. Each one of you deserves a different treatment because each one of you has a different cell line involved. Each one of you has a different goal in mind. Each one of you um, uh, might have certain illnesses that preclude one therapy versus another, um, all very, uh, very important. So any of these things are options, and I'm glad to field questions on any one of them. If you're not a transplant candidate and you have low-risk disease, the same is pretty much true. But in, in that group of patients, whether you're a transplant candidate or not, the next question really is, is treatment even needed? So don't be surprised if your physician tells you you don't need any treatment, but observation alone is warranted. Again, that means close surveillance, very important. Um, but sometimes we just watch the disease. Now, the high-risk patients that are not transplant candidates, to me, that group of patients should go on clinical trial. And in fact, I put an asterisk there because really everyone should, uh, I didn't change my, my asterisk down below, I apologize, but really everyone should consider a clinical trial up front if it's available, regardless of where they fall in this algorithm. Um, but this group of patients in particular, this high-risk group of patients, standard of care is azacitidine or decitabine, um, but a clinical trial is very important. Maybe we want to consider a trial looking at the addition of an HDAC inhibitor, as I mentioned earlier. Um, clinical trial is important. And so don't be afraid of clinical trials. And I do a separate talk entirely on the benefit of clinical trials. Remember, clinical trials are written in your best interest. I won't even open a clinical trial if it's not in the best interest of my patients. There are important questions that need to be answered. You're not going to get a placebo and have something done that is potentially harmful to you. So I think clinical trials are important. They're written with with the most strict ethical guidelines, and there are review boards that, that vet these things to make sure that your best interest is in mind and that I have no vested interest at, other than answering important medical questions for my patients and for and the whole of society. So consider clinical trials, and I would say don't be afraid of them. At least, um, at least get an initial look. The other caveat of clinical trials is you can back out at any time if, a, if you're on a clinical trial for any reason with no questions asked. Nobody has to force you uh, to stay on a trial. And, of course, if somebody progresses thereafter, well, maybe we want to consider a clinical trial then or consider chemotherapy, which is not an unreasonable thing to do. Every patient deserves best supportive care. That means transfusions. That means other methods of, 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 of potentially getting the iron down. That means antibiotics if necessary. Um, I would say it means support from the MDS Foundation, support from even the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Best supportive care is a group effort, and everybody deserves that. Um, and iron chelation therapy remains a point of contention, um, but is demonstrated in more recent trials to be beneficial in, in a significant number of patients. And I want to share with you here um, something that was shared with me by a very dear friend and colleague, Doug Smith, um, uh, who is also a, an MDS uh, treatment physician. I consider one of the uh, leading experts in the world in this uh, in this. this order, um, the paradigm that they uh, tend to use 
um, at Johns Hopkins, and that is the patients with the low to intermediate risk IPSS, the first question again, is therapy needed? Are growth factors an option? Number one, that's what we tend to start with. Remember with growth factors, you've got to watch your blood pressure. Make sure your blood pressure is well controlled by your primary care physician because that is something that might go up. Um, Watch for signs of blood clot. You may have seen in the news there is risk associated with that. And so um, you talk to your physician about those risk factors. If they have the 5Q minus abnormality, lenalidomide is a very, very good option. In the patients who don't, you can see here, uh, azacitidine, decitabine, lenalidomide are all options. Even thalidomide might be an option or, again, clinical trial. The high-risk patients, azacitidine, decitabine, why azacitidine tends to be preferred primarily because of the survival data, but both of these many physicians believe are a class effect and are, both are very, very um, uh, useful. And then lastly, allogeneic uh, uh, transplantation at the time of progression for low risk and the high risk patients as early, uh, as early as possible. And I want to just again close, I want to say thank you. I know I shared a lot of information. Take home points, talk to your physicians about quality of life. Um, have hope. Don't be afraid to talk to your physicians and share a dialogue. Unfortunately, the only thing we can do to risk stratify patients by today's standard is bone marrow biopsy. Um, and uh, if there were a way to do it without bone marrow biopsy, believe me, I'd be your biggest, biggest advocate and fan, but it's just not the case right now. So as, as hard as that is to do, it gives us valuable information. Um, and lastly, I want to put a face on the disease. These are patients who have this disease or similar diseases. And what I want to tell you again is that quality of life issue. It's very important with anybody that has a disease that is potentially life-threatening uh, to talk about what is important, um, to know what's important. This woman here uh, in the upper right-hand corner, I'm not violating HIPAA. All of these patients have agreed to allow me to share. Her goals were to be at her son's wedding and to get back into the classroom. Those were important goals to her. And so what I did up front, it sort of helped, you know, knowing that about her was important in guiding what my next step was going to be. Likewise, the woman down here said, you know what, I just, I, I, I got this young child. And that was very, very important. Very different than the guy who just loves to be retired with his wife and spend time. The goal of everybody is different. Or the young lady that was diagnosed shortly after the birth of her first child. These are all different people. Everybody's different. Don't be afraid to share with your physician who you are because it dramatically impacts how you might be, uh, how you might be treated. Um, I'm going to close there and, uh, and open for questions, and I really thank you for your attention, um, and I apologize it was so long. Thank you so very much, Dr. Rossetti. What an excellent presentation. While during the presentation we did have several questions, we may not be able to get to all of them, but I will do my best to field them to you. The first question we have is in reference to falling white blood cell counts. For the past six months, the white um, blood cell counts have fallen now at 1.6 and granulocytes at uh, 0.7. Their oncologists stopped by days of treatment and have been without treatment for two and a half months, could the Vidaza no longer be working? It worked very well for 19 months. In the last six months, my counts began to fall. Great question. And this is, this is the classic example of a bone marrow should probably be done. And the reason I say that is that your, your physician may be seeing something. I never like to step on anybody's toes without having all of the information. But with just the information I have, a bone marrow would be the most useful. It is possible the Vidaza is not working any longer because on average when it does work, it's about a year and a half or so. Uh, but some patients it's much longer. It's also possible that there's the cumulative toxicity of the Vidaza and that now your bone marrow is becoming too suppressed. And the bone marrow biopsy will tell you that. Is the disease getting worse and we have to change therapy? Or should we stop therapy and maybe start you on growth factors to build up the white count a little bit and then reinstitute the therapy maybe at a lower dose? So um, the bone marrow is going to give you the most information in that, uh, in that particular scenario unless there's something other obvious like blast rising in the bloodstream uh, or something to that effect. It's a wonderful question, and the best way to answer it is with a, a bone marrow. It's not unreasonable at all, by the way, to hold the Vidaza initially and just see if the counts improve. Um, but if they're not improving yet, a bone marrow would probably be the best thing, barring any other information I'm not aware of. Thank you. We have a couple of questions that are similar to this one. Maybe you can speak generally to this. Dr. Rossetti, is MDS now considered cancer? Uh, okay, and I did see that some people had typed in that question. Technically speaking, MDS is considered its own clonal malignancy or cancer, whether or not it ever becomes leukemia. Um, that said, 
what defines cancer in most in the general public's mind is is that ability to metastasize or spread from one organ to another area and so it's a double-edged sword and I, i'll tell you as a physician i think it's important for physicians to recognize it as a cancer primarily because it means to them this is a serious disease this is not something to be balked at again everybody's different some people very very low risk some people very very high risk how you treat is highly variable as we've talked about over the last hour but for physicians to recognize that it's worth using a drug that might make the white count better or the red count or platelets uh, make, make them worse rather before they get better is an important thing. And it took our understanding and physicians' understanding to say this is a serious, it's a malignancy. And it cannot be ignored and it's worth taking the risk of a treatment to get the patient better or we're going to lose ground and maybe never be able to treat them. So by strict definition, yes, it is a, it is a cancer, but that shouldn't scare the patient. That should actually give the patient hope to mean your physicians are working harder at finding better treatments and willing to do something about it now. Not only are they willing, but they can. Thank you so very much. This next question is in reference to, it seems, um, an insurance coverage issue. Maybe you can speak to it. They are of Medicare age but are current covered under their, their wife's policy. For 10 years, they were treated successfully with um, two common ESAs. They currently have um, RARS that was diagnosed 17 years ago, and they're in treatment for 10 years every week. The insurance suddenly changed their coverage, and they lowered the doses that they would cover. Will this have a negative effect on their health? Well, it's, it's, it's a little bit hard to predict. If you've had that length of a response, um, to that, that long of a duration of response, that's certainly very, very encouraging. Um, and I, I, would, I, I guess it depends on how much they lowered uh, the dose. Now, a couple of caveats. One is we know in MDS the doses necessary to get a response are oftentimes higher than they are for, say, anemia of renal disease or anemia of, of, of chronic disease. Um, that said, your physician should be able to follow that reticulocyte count that I talked about earlier. And if they see that the reticulocyte count is not responding quite as much uh, to the shots at the lower dose, um, then they can potentially petition the insurance company. And we have to do that very, very frequently to say, look, this just isn't working. And most often uh, through appeals, you can get, uh, get things changed around. Now, the other question is, is it just the fact that the dose has been lowered that the insurance company will cover? Or are they covering at a, high, at, a, at a change in the hemoglobin level? Because some insurance companies, perhaps rightly so, have said, look, we're not going to administer the drug at 12 we're gonna, or, or at, a, at 11, a hemoglobin, where some companies used to do, but now we're going to lower it to 10. And that might not be a bad thing. Um, and so I would say don't, don't be discouraged if that's the case, because pushing the hemoglobin too high can sometimes be a little bit dangerous. Um, and the other reason uh, not to be discouraged is that growth factors alone don't change the natural history of the disease. Growth factors aren't going to prevent leukemia or change anything. In other words, if the disease is going to progress, it's going to progress with or without the growth factors to a higher grade. But the change in dose might change your symptoms because your hemoglobin falls. And that's the type of thing you need to watch for and potentially get um, an appeal if it's not working quite as well. But in that scenario, my, my best friend would be the reticulocyte count. Uh, because it, it, if it starts to drop on the lower dose, you can potentially petition the insurance company or at least give it a try. Thank you. The next question is, before I was diagnosed with MDS, my white count was below 1. One year after, it is now 6.4. Should I have had treatment? Uh, uh, could you repeat that? I apologize. I lost you there. Certainly. Before I was diagnosed with MDS, my white count was below 1. One year after, it's 6.4. Should I have had treatment? So with no treatment, it was one, and, and now it's 6.4, or there was a treatment in there? It just says before they were diagnosed that their, I guess their normal, their regular count was below one, and one yeah. year after being diagnosed, it's gone to 6.4. Yeah, if um, if it's gone up spontaneously, then then no, you uh, uh, the, you wouldn't have needed treatment. Um, but the 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 need for treatment is primarily predicted by it's prim it's predicted by symptoms. And if you, if you had a low white blood cell count and weren't getting infected, then sometimes we just simply observe that. But the other thing is where you fell in that risk stratification model. If it was solely the white blood cell count, probably you fell on a lower end, and observation alone would have been warranted. Now, if you were getting recurrent infections and things, then that might change the tune, even in a low-risk patient. Um, but 
uh, no treatment is, is sometimes warranted, and in this case, it may very well be reasonable. The next person was diagnosed with MDS in February and has been receiving Vidaza since March. Over that time, they've encountered several symptoms and had, that have progressively become worse over the past few months. An example that they state is when they have physical activity like climbing stairs, they get chest pressure and pain, shortness of breath, and they have been tested for pulmonary and cardiac issues, but everything has had positive results. At this point, they seem like they can do nothing. Could this be the Vidaza treatments causing this? It's a little bit unusual for the Vidaza treatments themselves to cause those types of, of symptoms. Um, to be honest, it, it, it's, if it's a, it could be a reflection of the of the blood counts. I, I, I'm sorry, did you say, Catrell, that there was a hemoglobin associated with it or no? Did they, they did not give number? one. No, they so, did not. Of give course, one. the the hemoglobin is always something to consider. The other possibility is what we call cytokines, and cytokines are occasionally produced in this disease because of that dysregulation between the stroma and the cellular component I talked about earlier, and sometimes that can cause that sort of symptom. Um, I don't see that particular thing described with, uh, with azacitidine very often, to be honest. I would be more interested in the blood counts and to see if maybe there's something else that can, that can uh, blunt that by shutting down cytokines or something. Thank you. The next person relapsed with MDS eight months following an allergenic stem cell transplant, May of 2010. They began their 18th cycle of Vidaza later this month, and they have an IV every six weeks. They haven't needed any transfusion in over nine months. Their question is, what is the estimated time of survival with this current treatment? Uh, and, uh, Control, how many months did you say so far? Well, they've had eight. This is their 18th cycle, and they 18th have it cycle. every six weeks. Yeah. Every six weeks. Um, so that, that shows you right there that we can do different things. Spreading it out a little bit is, uh, is useful. Um, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to predict. Um, in somebody that's responded for that duration, um, those are the patients that I've seen go for years occasionally. On average, though, you, you figure that you're going to get about a year and a half of a response before you start to see things change. That's on average. But... We do see people, and if the counts aren't changing at all, normally those people that are going to lose the response at about a year and a half, we start to see at about a year the counts start to dip subtly. If things have been relatively stable, there's a good chance this could continue. And um, the other possibility, of course, is, is a second transplant an option? Um, is a clinical trial an option if it, uh, if it slips? Um, when somebody gets out that far, I'm always very reluctant to give numbers because I'm usually fooled by it, and, I, and I'm usually proven wrong. <laughs> okay. The next question is that of a, a patient that would like to try Aransnip, um for their anemias, but they're afraid that it may lower their stable uh, platelet count. In your experience, is there any basis for that fear? Not, not really. So Aranesp, um, in fact, the opposite tends to be true. Very rarely do the, do the erythropoietic agents cause a drop. In fact, it's known that erythropoietin and thrombopoietin, which is the molecule, that's the, the, the enzyme that stimulates platelet production, they share an amino acid sequence. So occasionally you get one, and the platelet count actually goes up. So I would say don't worry a whole lot about your platelets falling. If, you're, if your physician feels that you need growth factor support for your hemoglobin and, and you're symptomatic from anemia, um, that tends not to be a major issue. I don't see a lot of that, uh, to be quite, uh, quite honest. If the platelets fall, it's more because of the disease, not because of the, uh, of the therapy, in my experience. Thank you. This person's wife was diagnosed with MDS six months ago. She has now progressed to 10% blast. She also has eight different points of cytogenetic problems, including 5Q deletion and trisomy 8. How much do you run across or see this many cytogenetic problems, and how does it change the treatment? Complex abnormalities, meaning more than three abnormalities, we don't see all that often. But if somebody has 10% blast and a complex abnormality, and when I say all that often, it's about 10% or so. Um, but when we see somebody with a complex abnormality with an elevated blast count, um, even if it's marginally elevated, um, that is somebody that should, azacitidine or an agent like, like azacitidine or decitabine would be the preferred way to go um, because the risk of leukemic evolution in those patients is fairly high. And if the patient is a candidate for transplantation, that's also something that would be reasonable. The other thing in a patient like this that has 5Q along with other abnormalities might be a great candidate for a trial, uh, if possible on a clinical trial, of, of, of a methyltransferase inhibitor, azacitidine or decitabine, plus lenalidomide. Um, those, pop, those populations of people may benefit from the combination uh, therapy. So I think there's a host of ways that you could treat this. Um, 
the standard of care would be uh, be azacitidine or desitabine. A combination therapy in a clinical trial would be second, and of course, allogeneic transplantation would be something you should be thinking about all along if it's if if, if you're a candidate. The next question is, how does lenalidomide work, actually work? Oh boy, you, that's the, that's probably the hardest question to answer because the reality is it works in multiple ways. Um, lenalidomide and thalidomide both they target multiple pathways. One of the ways that I talked about earlier by the, that new blood vessel growth that might be feeding a cancer in the bone marrow, it shuts that off. That's why those drugs you have to go through all the paperwork and the rigmarole because you might limit normal. Um, blood growth in uh, in certain areas of the body, blood vessel growth, and that's why the, we've we've heard the the thalidomide children uh, that were born to mothers who used the drug um, uh, for nausea associated with uh, year, years or decades ago, uh, nausea associated with pregnancy, the limb malformation. Well, by that same way of choking off the blood supply to the cancer, that's one way. The other thing we know they do is they modulate the immune system. That's why they're called literally immune modulators, and they might turn on a mechanism by which the immune system can recognize this abnormal population of cells better. Um, they also have some effect on the cytokines that I talked about. And lastly, they may impact in some way that apoptosis that I talked about. So there's multiple pathways by which they work, uh, quite honestly. And for, for any of us to say it's any one of those things, we'd be lying to you. Um, it, it, they, hit tar they target multiple pathways. This is why these drugs are probably so effective. Thank you. The next patient was diagnosed with MDS one year ago with a 9.7 hemoglobin count. They have been responding to rare aracinib injections of 10.9, but without those injections, their count stays at 9.3. Is it better to avoid the aracinib or better to bring the hemoglobin up through the shots? I would say it really depends on your symptoms. Again, keep in mind that the, the ARNSP is not going to change your, your risk of progression either way, negatively or positively. If at 9.7 or 9.3 or whatever the number was, if you're feeling poorly, it's a very reasonable thing to look at the risks and benefits of it and say, okay, I'm willing to take them if I'm feeling better. Um, it, it, there's never an absolute with these things. Yes, I, I agree with you, in the, and I think the gist of the question, and all, a lot of the questions we face today are there are risks of therapy, and only you know when it's time to absolutely take that risk. Well, it's easier to take the risk of a therapy when you know your risk of leukemia in two months is very, very high. When you're simply, you know, maybe just a little short of breath when you're walking a few blocks, that might be different. And so you really have to ask yourself, what is now intolerable? Is my, is my energy level at that nine point, at whatever it was, low enough where I'm willing to assume the risk. Generally speaking, ARNSP is safe. If you monitor the hemoglobin closely, you monitor for blood, signs of blood clots, you monitor the blood pressure, et cetera. Um, but if you're at nine point something and you feel totally fine, personally, I'm a less is more kind of guy. I would say leave, do nothing. Um, but if you're symptomatic, uh, then strongly consider it. Thank you. The next person needs transfusions every six to eight weeks to maintain a hemoglobin count of 8.0. Can Revlimid be used? used with an ANC of 0.5? Uh, can it be used? Um, the, again, this is one of those areas where it's, there's no absolute. You can, you can anticipate that with lenalidomide, that number might fall. Now, it can be used. Can it always be used safely? Well, there are risks when you start low because we know that lenalidomide can drop that further about half the time. Um, and so you might need to add nupogen along with the lenalidomide. Now, the, the use of nupogen might be predicted by how bad the blast count is in the marrow. If it's very low, it's very safe to use nupogen. If it's very high or you have blast in your bloodstream, not so much. So um, I would say it, it can be if your physician is suggesting to you that it's an option, um, then doing it along with growth factor support might be important. In other words, using nupogen to help counter the potential drop from the lenalidomide. Um, as an MDS physician, the clinical trials that we review with agents like lenalidomide, we know we have a rough idea of what the likelihood of one of those other blood cell counts falling is. And even if that were normal, as you suggest that you already understand from your question, um, even if your, your neutrophil count were 2,000, it might fall to 1,000 or even lower with the treatment. If you're starting at 500, it might fall to even lower and increase your risk of infection. Doesn't mean we can't do it, but I would say – 
are there other things that we can potentially do? This sounds like initially a great, a great place to try combined growth factors, um, GCSF plus, plus um, erythropoietin, Neupogen plus Procrit or Aranesp or Nulasta plus um, Aranesp or any combination thereof. Um, and if that's failed, you could consider something like lenalidomide, but you have to do so very, very cautiously and follow the blood counts, I would say, a couple times a week um, because you might really wipe that count down. So if you've run out of other options, then you can consider it. You mentioned in your presentation neuropathy in hands and feet. I have neuropathy that has worsened in the last year. I was not aware that it had anything to do with MDS. I just assumed it was from lower back surgeries. Would you speak some more about neuropathy, please? That's, a great, uh, that's another great question, and this is a point of contention between MDS physicians. We're starting to see more and more people who have maybe a neuropathy associated with their MDS. I don't want to say it's a lot of people, but because of this cytokine activity and because of other things that we're probably not really aware of, quite honestly, as I said, we're very, really learning about this disease, there might be a possibility that it's associated. There's no definitive connection today, um, although I've talked to some MDS colleagues who say that they do see it. Um, the other possibility is if you're being treated for your MDS, certain treatments we know have a risk of, of neuropathy associated with them. If you've had another reason to have neuropathy, it's much more likely to be from that reason than it is from the MDS. But um, if you had the back surgery and it all went away and then it came back with your diagnosis of MDS, um, it, the timing of things becomes very, very important. So I can't say it's definitively linked. Um, it's more frequently linked to some of the treatments we have. Um, but if you have another explanation, it's usually more likely that, to be honest. Thank you. I have been diagnosed with hypoplastic myelodysplastic syndrome this week. The hematologist has suggested immunosuppressive therapies with a drug called cyclosporine. Would you agree to this? I have no abnormal cytogenetics. I'm a female and 57 years old. Uh, immune suppressive therapy is a, um, is, a, is a good way to go, and there's many ways to skin that cat. If your physician has um, a, a good experience with, with cyclosporin, it's, it's a very reasonable thing to do. Cyclosporin is a mainstay for patients with, hy with hypoplastic MDS. Some, pa some people still start growth factors depending on which cell line is low. Um, if for whatever reason your physician feels that growth factor support is not um, the best uh, for you and immune suppression is, is better. I think it's very reasonable to start with one agent. Some people start with steroids first, and if they respond to steroids, switch over to cyclosporin or its cousin drug, tacrolimus, also known as Prograf or FK506. And some people just start the cyclosporin and see how, they, how it goes. And if you start to see an improvement in the counts or a reticulocyte count improvement, then continue it. Um, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's not an unreasonable thing by any stretch of the imagination. I especially like the idea if your physician's not necessarily just jumping into the aggressive um, triple immune therapy, which is much more immune suppressive, and trying something a little lower first. I, I like that approach because if your counts aren't that bad and you have a little bit of time to play with it, that's kind of a, that's a nice thing to do. And uh, so, no, I, I think it's a very reasonable thing to do. You just have to follow your blood counts and you have to follow your um, the levels of the cyclosporin, um, watch your kidney function, stay hydrated. Um, these are just some of the things that are anybody that's on these, on these uh, types of drugs and watch for signs and symptoms of infection. Thank you. How long can you live on regular? How long can you live by regularly regularly receiving Vitesa? Um, it, it, again, it varies. It varies greatly. If one were to look at the the uh, averages, and and it also depends significantly on the stage of the disease at the time of diagnosis. Um, the really high risk patients, again, normally, and I, I don't want to say how long do you live because the survival numbers and the duration of response numbers are, are oftentimes very different. But we, st we oftentimes in the responders see people go um, 18 months on average, or maybe two years on average. Um, the lower risk patients, even longer. Um, but again, how long can you live? I treated a patient with high, high risk disease that survival was so limited, but I treated him for seven plus years and he died of something totally unrelated um, because he was older and he had other illnesses. Um, so how long can you live? Um, it can be very long. Um, it's, there are averages, but that varies, and I wouldn't be able to answer it definitively for you individually. But I'd say have hope if you have high risk disease and are responding because I've seen people go years. Thank you. Is there a clinical trial that proves that five days of Videsa is as effective as seven days? There, there are clinical trials that demonstrate that they're, uh, that they're equally effective, that there's no uh, significant difference uh, between the two. We actually here at our institution use a five-day regimen 
Um, the trials aren't huge, um, but the, the data and, and in general, the overall um, consensus from the community and from all of the, pay, uh, the, the MDS docs, um, most would say seven days is okay. Now, I will tell you, we use a higher dose at, during the five days um, than just the 75, but the data is pretty clear that whether you go 5 two, 2 or 7 straight or just 5, the outcomes are pretty, um, are pretty similar. The seven-day data is what largely looks at the survival. Um, so in terms of response rates, yes, that's true. The response seems to be the same across the board. Our five-day survival data is very similar. Again, it's not published data, but um, is very similar to what was seen in the overall survival data with the AZA-001 trial. So I think a five-day regimen is a very reasonable thing to do, um, especially in somebody whose disease is maybe at a little bit of a low risk, uh, a lower risk, and also in somebody who might be intolerant of, of, of seven days. Sometimes five days is a reasonable thing to do in somebody that's a little bit sicker from other illnesses. Dr. Rossetti, is there a clinical trial that proves that injections given subcutaneously are as effective as port infusions? Of, of a drug like azacitidine, they're equivalent. Um, whether you give it intravenously or subcutaneously, they're the same. Thank you. The next question is a doozy. I'm going to do my best to relay it to you. I have treatment-related MDS, a refractory MDS, with greater than three chromosomal abnormalities, including plus eight, negative um, minus 17 P minus 20 plus 22 uh, pseudo dicentric chromosome composed of 14 plus 22 in addition to 5 Q minus. Can you discuss these abnormalities as related to MDS or do you have a good reference? This is a nurse. Um, what I can tell you is two things. Um, number one, the complexity of it and the fact that it's treatment related. Um, both suggest that a methyltransferase inhibitor or clinical trial and, and eventually transplant is, is the best way to go um, with this. The 17P deletion tends to be a, a, high, a high risk abnormality by itself even, even if it were seen in a, virtually any malignancy that we, uh, that we treat. Um, there are a lot, of, a lot of good references out there um, in regard to cytogenetics, and, but, but more importantly is just to know that you, you have a complex and one of them by itself even is a, is a high risk abnormality. So if, you, if you're well enough to be aggressive in your course, that's what I would suggest um, for you. I do have experiences with virtually all of those. We see those across the board. Um, and and the, some of the ones you mentioned that by themselves are high risk and together certainly they're high risk. So, um, you know, aggressive therapy if possible would be, uh, would be warranted. And the last question, we are over time. Uh, a 74-year-old male, his, his high IPSS, two weeks post dacogen daily, um, five times um, for four months, we had a great response. There was a blood transplant independent. I'm not, I don't understand the question, but I guess what is the next bone marrow biopsy and what blood counts should they look for with dacodin maintenance. Um, okay, so when when to do a bone marrow biopsy? If, if, uh, I'm going to speak to two things. I'm not sure if there was a transplant in this question or not after the initial decitabine um, or if it was just continued decitabine. So I'll just speak very, very quickly to both of those. If, um, if you're continuing on decitabine alone, there's no absolute as to when you have to do a bone marrow. And I can tell you Everybody's different. Um, some physicians say I want them every three months because I want to document the depth of the of the response. Generally speaking, I like to do one at about three months um, to see how how things are responding. If things are going in the right direction and the blood counts are really good, I don't require a bone marrow in a patient unless I'm going to transplant or something. I don't require it if the blood counts are stable. The answer, the easy answer, and the, the obvious answer is if your blood counts drop, any one of them, white cells, red cells, platelets, if any of them go down at any time um, significantly from your, from your baseline, and you also need to know your nadir because dacogen and if I days and all these drugs about two weeks after will drop the counts and then they tend to rise back up, um, and that's what we call the nadir count. If you, if you hit your nadir between cycles, and sometimes you don't, by the way, sometimes after you get a good response it stays up, but if you know that predictably in between cycles you drop to a certain degree, um, and then go back up, great. You don't necessarily need a bone marrow. But if you're seeing a more profound drop or a drop that's consistently falling, then you need a bone marrow. And again, the answer is, the, the reason is, is it my bone marrow failing because of my, my, the treatment's too strong, or is my bone marrow failing because the disease is progressing? And so 
Um, definitely when your blood counts change any, uh, significantly any number of those things or if you start to see blasts in the peripheral blood. Um, now, if you've had a transplant and you're on maintenance to site of being on, say, a clinical trial or your physician's doing that internally, which is some, some physicians will, um, will do, um, the answer of maintenance dacogen in that setting is very, very different. We don't know the, out, the long-term outcomes in that population of people, but that's the crux of ongoing um, clinical trials. So if your physician's not going to transplant, doing marrows when the counts change is important. Um, and if your physician likes to just know where you are, then I, I defer to them. Uh, but I don't require them unless there's something I'm going to do clinically with the information in terms of changing your particular treatment. Thank you so very much, Dr. Rossetti, for your informative presentation and for your time. And on behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, I would like to thank each of you for joining us today and for making us your resource of choice for information on bone marrow failure diseases. If we were unable to answer your question today, please send it to us via email at help, H-E-L-P, at A-A-M-D-S dot org. Again, help at aamds.org so that our patient educator can respond or please visit our online learning center for interviews with experts and other programs that may address your question. As a reminder, as soon as I'm done speaking, a post-event survey will appear on your screen requesting feedback. We appreciate you taking the time to complete this survey. Again, thank you for joining us and please remember we are here to provide you with answers, support, and hope. This concludes today's program. Thanks, Katrell.